All righty, <clears throat> it's uh, 1230, so uh, we're going to get started. I'm going to take roll. Um, Grant Amerson. Yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, let's see, Brandon Ashlock. Thank you. Um, Jacob Bouton. Yes. Thank you. Thomas Casey. Claire Cadesius. Okay, I'm gonna screw that up. Just um, Chandler Davidson. Thank you. Uh, Juliana Damari. I uh, see Cameron Dreyer is on Zoom. Uh, Brooke Edmondson. Uh, Julia Everett. Jack Foyle. Here. Thank you. Garrett Gresham. Uh, Daniel Hill, uh, Brian Jose, is that, is it, is your last name Jose? Yeah. Okay. Yos? Yeah. Joes. Okay. Uh, Cade Leo. All right. Uh, Jacob Matthews. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Dylan Miller. Uh, Noah Perkins. Alexander Petty. Uh, Nicole Robles, thank you. Uh, Tristan Sharp, uh, Joseph Sahara, uh, Kinsley Spatafora, Sophia Urbina, alrighty, uh, Race Wickland, and uh, that's uh, that's all I've got for the A section. If in, I didn't. Excuse me. If I missed anybody, please uh, just let me know at the end of class. So I. Thomas Casey is in the B section, which means you're supposed to be here. Oh, okay. 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 I got you. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. That makes sense. All right. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, let me ask you guys a question. Is this volume that I'm speaking? with okay, can everybody hear me and all that kind of jazz? Um, all right, as you can see, I have an oxygen tank with me um, because uh, I am still in the process of, uh, like my lungs are healing from having uh, the coronavirus a couple of weeks ago and all that kind of stuff. So I might periodically stop class to take my oxygenation levels and then see whether or not I need to be on oxygen. So I just wanted to give you guys a heads up of you know what's gonna go down here. Um, all right, so today's class, uh, the video lecture, was about Ohm's Law, Kirchhoff's Voltage Law, and Kirchhoff's Current Law. Uh, so did you guys have any questions uh, about any of that material? Or any questions on the in-class assignment? Or uh, has anybody looked at the subsequent homework assignment? Uh, yes, sir, in the flat chart. Okay. So let's. Which uh, which problem in particular are you? Okay, two for sure. All righty. Um, so this problem. Hopefully, let me make sure this is what I'm sharing. It look, it says I'm screen sharing. That's okay. Um, so, in this problem, you're asked to use Kirchhoff's voltage law to determine the unknown voltages Vx and Vy. Um, so what we're going to try to do is identify a closed path, meaning we start and end at the same point, that contains only one variable. So there are several different uh, loops that we could draw here. Uh, let's see, one, two, three, four loops. Um, and I think like seven or eight different paths that we could use. Um, so let's see. Uh, one thing, I have two resistors in this circuit and I don't have an associated voltage drop over them. Uh, so this resistor right here 
and this resistor right here have no associated voltage drops or anything with them. We could find them, but what I'm going to try to do is avoid them because I know no information whatsoever about them. So they're really kind of more trouble than they're worth. So avoiding these two resistors, that limits the number of paths that I have. So we're going to start by trying to find the voltage Vx, um, which is defined as the voltage drop over this resistor on the left-hand side that I haven't crossed out. So we know that we're going to be using this portion of the paper. So I'm just going to continue following through. Now I reach this middle section, and while there isn't a wire or anything connecting this point in the circuit and this point in the circuit, there is a known voltage, okay? And that's very important. Um, because there's a known voltage, and Kirchhoff's voltage law is simply adding up voltages, this can be a part of my path as well, where I have a known voltage. And then finally, I'm gonna come through, through my six volt source, where I also have a known voltage. And I can now write the Kirchhoff's voltage law equation around the path that I've outlined in blue. Okay, so it does not matter that a portion of this path can't carry current. It only matters that we know the voltage drop over that part that can't carry current. All right, so that's what's allowing us to write a case, excuse me, a KVL equation. So starting from the bottom left hand corner, I see the negative polarity terminal of our voltage Vx. So I'm going to have negative Vx going across the top. That's just a wire. There's no voltage drop across the short circuit as was discussed in the, uh, the video lecture. So that's just going to be plus zero. So I'm not going to bother writing it down. Then I see the positive polarity terminal of the 12 volt drop between the top node and the middle node. So I'll have plus 12. Then I see the negative polarity terminal of the six volt source. So I'm gonna have minus six volts. And then I end up at the point I started with. So that is my closed path. And from this, I can see easily that Vx is 12 volts minus six volts is equal to six volts. So at no point did I have to worry about the current splitting up or anything like that in, in this particular. Now we are absolutely going to get to a place to where we're going to have to develop relationships for that, but we're not quite ready, okay? Um, so now we, sorry, yes, sir. Sure, so I'm following my blue line around in this direction, which I'm indicating with my arrows, okay? I'm starting from here, and I see the negative sign first. So if I see the negative sign first, it gets a negative sign in my equation. If I see the positive sign first, it gets a positive sign in my equation. Yeah, so this negative right here is with the Vx. So it might, might be a little less confusing if I drew the negative here and the positive here, uh, and similarly the positive here for the 12 and the negative here. It's still associated, they're still associated with the exact same nodes. It just might be a little bit more clearly drawn in that way, that you see the negative sign first. Right. And it just doesn't matter where you start? Absolutely not. It doesn't matter where you start, and it doesn't matter what direction you go. I pretty much always start at the bottom left-hand corner and go clockwise. Um, just because that's uh, the habit that I've developed from doing this for so long. But we could get the exact same relationship, uh, probably multiplied by, well, definitely multiplied by a factor of negative one if we had gone um, counterclockwise. And we would just have the things in a different order if we started at a different point. But it does not matter where you start. It does not matter what direction you do, as long as you're consistent. So you can't, like, change directions in the middle of a loop or something like that. All right, um, so for the second part of this problem, we're asked to find the voltage Vy. 
Um, so does anybody have any ideas about what loop I should use for that? Based on kind of how I've done things. Yes, ma'am. So if I do a figure eight, um, I will go, I, I will be including this resistor, which I know nothing about. So let me change colors real quick. So you're saying these for sure. Am I? Okay, so around the outside like this. Or go down. Okay. So this will absolutely work, um, but it's, it's larger than it needs to be. And let me explain what I mean by that. Um, so the loop that I've outlined in red here will absolutely work, um, but it's got this BX guy in there and this six volts in there that we could avoid by going up right here over that known voltage, right? So we're gonna introduce that second variable VX, which we already know what it is, so it's not that big of a deal. It's just gonna give us a little bit more extra work. So it's not the smallest possible path. Now there's nothing wrong with not choosing the smallest possible path. And we can actually go through and work both of them and show that we're gonna get the exact same answer. Um, it's just, um, I guess, a little bit more inefficient. And one of the things that I'm gonna try uh, my damnedest to do in this class is to drill into you guys to search for the most efficient means by which to solve your problems. Uh, and the reason that I'm gonna do that is because quite honestly, um, you could work all of your exams in this class using only what you learned in the first couple of days. Truly, it might take you 40 minutes to work a problem only using, say, Kirchhoff's current law, Kirchhoff's voltage law, and Ohm's law, but you'll get there eventually. Uh, but what we're going to do throughout, you know, pretty much everything past um, next Monday is going to be adding tools to our toolbox to increase our efficiency and look at the circuits in a little, little bit of a different way in order to simplify them and increase our speed. Uh, because the exams are going to be, you know, 30 questions long, and uh, if it takes you 40 minutes to answer one, uh, you're pretty well hosed. So we got to be thinking about ways that we can trim off a little, bit of a, a little bit of fat in each problem and stuff like that. All right, so to that end, let's work the problem here, part B, using um, the path that takes up the three window panes, I guess is one way to call it. So this path, uh, and we'll start, um, from the same point that we started before and follow this clockwise. Um, so starting from here, we would again have negative VX, zero along the entire top, plus VY, then we see the positive polarity terminal for the four volt source. We see the, uh, a wire, so that's plus zero. A negative polarity terminal for a six volt source, and then a negative polarity terminal for a six volt source, and set this equal to zero. Substituting in Vx is six volts, what we are left with, let's see if I can uh, do some algebra here. So I'm gonna have VY on this side. So I had negative VX and when I move it to the other side, that's gonna be positive six volts. When I move this positive four volts to the other side, I'm gonna have minus four volts. When I move this positive or negative six to the right hand side, I get plus six volts. When I move the second negative six, I get plus six volts. So that is two plus six plus six is 14 volts, which is the correct answer. Now, 
just for argument's sake. Let's come up through here and to satisfy uh, the gentleman with the American flag balaclava, we will go in the opposite direction and start from somewhere else. So let's go this way. And let's start from here. Okay. So we would see, following my arrows around, we would see the negative four volt, uh, the negative polarity terminal of the four volt source. So negative four volts. Then we see negative VY. We have the wire at the top, which has a zero volt drop. We see the positive polarity terminal of that 12 volt difference over that open circuit. We see the positive polarity terminal of the six volt source. And then we're back at our original uh, point. So we set this equal to zero. When I move VY to the other side of the equal sign, I'm going to have negative four volts plus 12 volts plus six volts. So eight plus six is still 14 volts. So I went in the entirely opposite direction around an entirely different loop and still came up with the exact same answer. So I hope that satisfies that you can start wherever, you can go in whatever direction you want. If you're applying KVL correctly, meaning you're just adding up all the voltage drops, you're gonna get the right answer. Um, okay, did that satisfy you guys on uh, this particular problem? Good deal. Uh, any questions on any uh, other problems in the in-class assignment, uh, homework set, or anything like that? Yes, sir. So for problem three, can we assume the polarity of the resistors to be the same as what? As the voltage on the left. Um, sure. So, so you're saying, um, or I guess let me the black. So we could absolutely say that the voltage drop Vx occurs over the two kilo ohm resistor and or the three kilo ohm resistor. It's also the voltage drop over all of these sources with positive polarity on top and negative polarity on bottom uh, because all of the elements are connected in parallel. So we know that the potential difference between our top node and our bottom node is Vx regardless of where we measure it in the circuit. Um, So to that end, uh, I don't know how many of you guys have gone through and worked this problem, um, but it's, I, I feel it's fairly straightforward because it is a single node pair circuit, you're gonna have to apply Kirchhoff's current law um, and that's going to leave you with um, one equation and at least three unknowns, depending on how you go about expressing things. Um, so let's take a moment uh, to, to, to go ahead and do that. Let's write our KCL equation. So I've got my top node. And my bottom node. All right, that guy just showed up for attendance and then bailed. All right, well, it is what it is. Um, so which of the three Kirchhoff's current law relationships do you guys want to use? Well, actually, really, for a problem like this, um, N is equal to out is probably not the smartest way to go. It'll, it'll get a little bit confusing. Um, well, not really. Um, but I mean, do you want to adopt the convention that uh, currents that are leaving the top node are positive? Do you want to adopt the convention that currents are entering the top node are positive? Do you want to adopt the convention that currents that are entering the bottom node is positive? 
or do you want to adopt the current that currents exiting the bottom node is positive? Which, uh, which, which way do you guys care to do it? Entering the top node is positive. Okay. So if you're writing an expression for currents entering the top node as positive, then the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to label currents through elements that don't currently have a label. So for instance, the six kilo ohm resistor, we already have a current labeled for that one. It's the current IX. We can see that the current flows into that negative polarity terminal and out the positive polarity terminal as it makes that right hand turn in the top left corner. Uh, obviously, all of our current sources have an indicated direction. So really, we just need to figure out what current is going to flow through the two kilo ohm resistor and the three kilo ohm resistor. And we just need to say, well, you know, one's flowing down, one's flowing up, or both are flowing down, or both are flowing up. We just need to make a guess. So does anybody have a suggestion? Okay, so let's call that I2K. What about the three kilo ohm resistor? Oh, okay, so the three kilo ohm resistor is the same as IY. All right, so that one's taken care of. All right, so the really the only one then that we needed to do was the I2 uh, kilo ohm. Okay, we're, we're good to go there. All righty, so applying the convention that currents that are entering the top node are positive, we can see that the current IX should be positive, right? Because as it flows through this six kilo ohm resistor, it's entering the top node. Uh, the six milliamps is also entering the top node, so it will be positive. Uh, the current supplied by the dependent source uh, for IX is flowing out of the node, so it should be negative. Our current through our two kilo ohm resistor I2K is flowing down, so it should be negative. Our two milliamp source is flowing down, so it should be negative. And our current IY is flowing down as it flows through the three kilo ohm resistor. So it should also be negative. Those are all of our currents. So we set it equal to zero. So right now we have one equation and three unknowns. Because this is a single node pair circuit, meaning all of the elements are connected in parallel, the most powerful piece of information that we can find is the voltage drop over any element because it's going to be the same over all of the elements as we discussed previously. When everything's in parallel, everything has the exact same voltage drop. So how can we figure out what that voltage Vx is in relation to our three unknowns in our original equation? What, what equation do we have that relates current and voltage through a resistor? Ohm's law, right? Because all of, so Ix is the, is the voltage, excuse me, is the current that flows through a resistor. Iy is the current that flows through a resistor. And I2k is the current that flows through a resistor. So our best bet here is to just simply apply Ohm's law to get those currents in relation with Vx. So let's start with the relationship between Ix and Vx. Anybody have any thoughts on what that's going to be? So I heard, I believe, Vx is equal to Ix times six kilohms. What was that? So the, the value of the voltage is going to be negative here. And the reason that the voltage is negative is because the current is flowing into the negative polarity terminal. Okay, so that's going to be what satisfies 
our relationship that the resistor has to absorb power, okay? So any time that we're trying to express the voltage drop over resistor in terms of a current, we need to pay attention to what the, uh, which polarity terminal the current is flowing into. If it's flowing into the negative polarity terminal, we need to add a negative sign. If it's flowing into the positive polarity terminal, it should have a positive sign. So Vx is six kilo ohms times Ix. That's perfectly great. Um, I'm gonna rearrange this ever so slightly and say that Ix is negative Vx divided by six kilo ohms, uh, just so we can put it in a form that where we can drop it into our original equation uh, easily. Uh, what about um, our current I2K? How are we gonna relate that to the voltage Vx? Sorry, what was that? Vx over two kilo ohms, perfectly correct. So we have I2K is positive Vx because the current is flowing into the positive polarity terminal divided by the resistance of two kilo ohms. And finally, Iy is gonna be what? Somebody that isn't sure. Vx over three kilo ohms, right? So if we substitute in these three Ohm's law relationships into our original equation, what we should find, uh, let's see, is I'm gonna have, so let's say I have Ix minus four Ix, so that's negative three Ix in total. I'm making a simplification there, right? So negative three times Ix, which is negative Vx over six kilo ohms, minus two kilo ohms, or excuse me, I two kilo ohms. So that's Vx over two kilo ohms minus Iy, which was Vx over three kilo ohms, will be equal to negative six milliamps minus two milliamps. And uh, we could simplify this further, but it's in a place where my calculator can do it pretty easily. I'm just using the numerical solver. So I'm gonna go ahead and take care of that. So I have negative three multiplied by negative X. Over 6,000. Minus X over 2,000 minus X over 3,000 is equal to negative 0 0.006. There we go. Um, Let me calculate think about it. I got X is 24 um, because my calculator ran out of memory. Oh, you're absolutely right. It should be plus two here. Calculator's looking like it's running out of memory. So I get Vx is equal to 12 volts from this expression. So that is the answer that I got here. So everything is hunky dory. And now that I know what Vx is, it's rather trivial to figure out what Ix and Iy are because we've already developed those relationships using Ohm's law. So Ix is negative Vx over six 
So negative 12 over six should be negative two. And then look at our units. Um, volts per kilo ohm is a milliamp. And finally, IY is VX over three kilo ohms. So 12 over three is four volts per kilo ohm is a milliamp. And there we go. Uh, honestly, that problem right there is I think a little harder than uh, the homework problems that you guys are assigned for this particular lecture. So um, if that makes sense to you, um, that's fantastic. Uh, the one caveat that I would, again, try to reinforce is when you're applying Ohm's law, make sure to pay attention to whether the current is flowing into the negative polarity terminal or the positive polarity terminal, because that's gonna determine whether or not you need a negative sign or a positive sign in your answer. Um, okay. Any other questions about applying Ohm's law, KCL, or KVL? Yes, sir. So you want to identify kind of the type of circuit, really. So whether it's a single node pair circuit, because that means that you're probably going to need to apply Kirchhoff's current law first, uh, whether it's a single loop circuit, where everything is connected in series, which means you're going to want to apply KVL first. And if it's neither of those, uh, then largely you're going to probably have to apply both of them. Um, you may have to apply them at several points. Um, so let me, let me find a problem where it's real quick that we could work using a, a combination of Ohm's law, Kirchhoff's current law, and Kirchhoff's voltage law. Let's see. Actually, maybe I'll make one up. Yeah, I'll just make one up. And what we are trying to find here in this example problem is the power absorbed by the 10 ohm resistor. All right, so this particular problem is obviously not a single node pair circuit because if we went through and we identified our nodes, we would see that we have one, two, those colors maybe were too close together. can't have a single node pair circuit if there are more than two nodes. It just doesn't work. Um, this isn't a single loop circuit because not all of the elements are connected in series. Um, and we can see that obviously the 10 ohm resistor and the two amp source are connected in parallel because they share both the orange node and the blue node. So we're going to have to apply a combination of techniques, both KCL and KVL most likely, uh, as well as Ohm's law in order to, to solve this thing. So let's talk about what information we're going to need to get our answer, right? We're trying to find the power absorbed by a resistor. So what information do we need to determine that? So it can be current times voltage. It could be current squared times resistance or it could be voltage squared divided by resistance. So if we know either the voltage or the current, we'll be able to determine our power. So what polarity do we want to assign for our voltage? Let's just pick one, positive polarity on top 
or negative polarity on bottom? Or po excuse me, positive polarity on top or negative polarity on top? Positive on top, all right. So I'm gonna call this guy V10. Now, uh, because it may turn out that the current is easier to find, uh, should we choose direction up or direction down? Let's, okay, direction going up. Let's call this guy I10. All right, so. While we're not specifically asked for this information, it's going to be useful. Um, so I'm going to assign a voltage and a current to our 6 ohm resistor as well, so that we have kind of everything in the circuit well defined, all right? So for the 6 ohm resistor, do we want positive polarity on left or positive polarity on the right? Okay, positive polarity on the left. So plus V6, and do we want the current flowing left or right? L left, okay. Let's call this I6. All right, so let's see what we can do. Um, we can write three Kirchhoff's voltage law equations. Uh, we can write one for the left loop, one for the right loop, or one around the perimeter of the circuit. And then for Kirchhoff's current law, we're really going to only be limited. Now we could, we could write three, one for each node, yeah. So we could have a total of six different equations that we could use here. Uh, and the question begs, well, which ones are the right ones? The answer is technically all of them. Uh, you, you can't go wrong. We probably won't need all six, but we're just gonna kind of try a kitchen sink approach where we just throw everything at it and see what sticks uh, because that's really the best that we can do. Why did it stop? on, it's connected. Oh, while we're waiting for the projector to reboot, I'm going to take my oxygen level. Right, 96%. Um, let me re plug this guy in. All right, okay, so um, let's see. I'm gonna write a KCL expression for the orange node. All right, so um, my current of I6 is leaving, right? So I can say that I6 will be equal to the currents that are entering, which is I10 plus two amps. So that's one equation, and we presently have four total unknown quantities. Um, so now let's come up with a Kirchhoff's voltage law equation. Uh, and I'm going to do it around the left hand loop starting from the bottom left hand corner and going clockwise, okay? So I see the negative polarity terminal of the four volt source. I see the positive polarity terminal of V6 and I see the positive polarity terminal of E10, and I can set this equal to zero. So I now have two equations and four unknowns. 
So I need to come up with two other equations. And the equations that I'm gonna to choose to use here are Ohm's law equations, because I know that I6, the current flowing through the six ohm resistor, is related to the voltage V6, the voltage drop over the six ohm resistor because of Ohm's law. Similarly, I know that I10 and V10 are related through Ohm's law as well. So, let's look at V6. How am I going to get an expression for V6 in terms of I6? I6 times six ohms. Now, is the current going into the positive polarity terminal or the negative polarity terminal? It's going to the negative, so it should be negative I6 times six ohms. Um, all right, now let's look at uh, the voltage V10. How am I going to relate that to the current I10? Negative I10 times 10 ohms. All right, so negative 10 ohms times I10. And so now we could substitute these Ohm's law relationships into either of our other relationships and we'd have a two equation, two unknown system, right? Um, so let's substitute our Ohm's law relationships into our KBL at left-hand loop equation. So we're gonna have V6, so that's negative six ohms times I6 minus 10 ohms times I10 is equal to positive four volts. Um, and for this guy right here, I'm just going to rewrite it very slightly. I6 minus I10 ohms is equal to positive 2 amps. So we have one equation, two equations, and now our only unknown quantities are our two currents. And if we know I10, that's enough information to figure out what the power is, right? If I had made a substitution of my Ohm's law equations into my KCL equations, I would have everything in terms of V10 and V6, which would still be enough information to solve. So it really doesn't matter which substitution we do. And honestly, we didn't necessarily have to use Ohm's law here. Well, maybe, maybe we did. Um, I was gonna say there's definitely more equations that we could have written using KCL and KVL. Uh, but I just chose one of each because I know that that's going to give me enough to get through this thing. Uh, that, that's my level of, of expertise with these guys. All right, so if I solve this system, I believe you guys got some experience using your calculators to solve systems of equations in Engineering 122. Is that correct? Anybody have any idea what I'm talking about solving the system? We could do it by substitution, but I'm lazy and calculators are there for a reason. Um, so, let's see, my coefficient for I6 in my first equation is 1, my coefficient for I10 in my first equation is negative 1, my constant value is positive 2, my coefficient for I6 in my second equation is negative 6, my coefficient for I10 in my first equation is negative 10, and this is gonna be equal to positive four, solve, and I get I6 is positive one amp, and I10 is negative one amp. Just to be clear, I'm gonna double check my Equation, so one, negative one, positive two, negative six, negative 10, positive four. Okay, so from this, what is uh, the power absorbed by our 10 ohm resistor? It's just gonna be I10 squared divided by, excuse me, multiplied by the 10 ohm resistor. I10 
10 squared times 10 ohms looks like negative 1 amps quantity squared times 10 ohms is positive 10 watts. Any questions? All right, so one thing that you're going to notice probably pretty early on in circuits, and it's, it's actually maybe the thing that discourages the students the most, um, is that there are always multiple different ways that we can approach a circuit in order to solve it. And especially on your exams, uh, I intentionally don't say use nodal analysis on this problem or use KCL or KVL on this problem or anything like that. I kind of just let you go at it with whatever way you guys feel comfortable. Um, but that's you know both a good thing and a bad thing uh, because I've observed that some students tend to use a few circuit analysis techniques um, as a crutch. Uh, and so what I mean by that is largely when students learn mesh analysis, then they try to use mesh analysis to solve everything. Um, it's, it goes back to the old adage, um, when the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Mesh analysis is extraordinarily powerful, um, not more so than some of the other techniques we're gonna learn, but it's also very easy to apply and students tend to get hung up on just using that over and over and over again um, where I've observed that, it, you know, students regularly will use mesh analysis, which involves setting up a system of equations and then solving it to work a problem that you could literally solve using Ohm's law. Um, so I would encourage you guys to work as many example problems and stuff as you can that reinforce these basic concepts, KCL, KVL, and Ohm's law, because those are what you should be looking for first. Those are the easy way to do it. Mesh analysis is easy and powerful, but it does involve setting up systems and equations, which means that there's a lot more opportunity for simple mistakes. So you know, just be aware of all of the tools that you have and try to put them all into practice. Um, all right, does anybody else have any other questions? Great, well, we're finishing three minutes early for our 15 minute session. So um, thanks for coming and uh, See you guys, uh, let's see, Friday. Oh, Friday we have a lab. It is important. You guys are gonna be paired off in two man teams. It is critically important that there are two multimeters in each team. Um, so bring your multimeter from your engineering 120 class. I, I think I have four or five um, that I can bring to allow some students to borrow, but you know, four or five for 25 of you guys may not be enough. So try very hard to bring your multimeters and I will try to send out an email to remind you of that. All right. All righty. Start with uh, taking some roll here. Garrett Anders. Brandon Bolin. Joshua Brack. Thomas Casey. Courtney Gifford, Paul DeSolar, William Drake, uh, Jean Dugas, John, okay. uh, Joshua Ekachuku. Jonah Fitzgerald, uh, Christian Gil Bustamante, Michael Abair, Carrick Inabnet, Inabnet, uh, Emma Koch. Coach, all right. Uh, Briley Marchand. I see Emma Michael is on Zoom. Uh, Shahara Pereira.
Cameron Petrus. Alrighty. Alec Reddick. Colton Schreiber. Leslie Sierra. Uh, Adam Swallow. Jillian Stal Stalder. Sorry. Jace Warren. And Karen Wood. Is that how you pronounce it remotely? Kyron? All right. Let's save that. Paul DeSolar is here. All righty. Okay. Um, so I'm Dr. Hartman. Uh, first day back from uh, quarantine and all that jazz, but it's been several weeks since I tested positive for COVID, so everything should be uh, groovy at this point. Um, I am still having issues with my lungs, uh, which is why there's a big tank of oxygen up here at the front of the room, and I have to constantly, well, not constantly, but periodically uh, check my oxygenation levels um, to make sure that I'm not going to give myself brain damage from talking too much and stuff like that. So if I have to stop for a few minutes, um, you know, just giving you a heads up. Uh, can everybody hear me uh, okay? All right. Um, so today's lecture was on uh, Ohm's Law, Kirchhoff's Current Law, and Kirchhoff's Voltage Law, uh, which means it was hopefully largely a review from what you guys did in uh, Engineering uh, 120. Maybe a little bit more in depth, hopefully a little bit more in depth actually, um, but uh, I guess where I'd like to start is to ask if anybody has any kind of general questions regarding the material. Okay. So um, I believe what I did was I followed the perimeter of the circuit clockwise. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So the reason that I had a negative 120 there was because you see as you follow <clears throat> as you follow the loop around the circuit, um, you see the negative sign first. So if you see the negative sign first, it should have a negative sign in your equation. If you see the positive polarity terminal first, it should have a positive sign in the equation. Uh, and if we have to work any of the, uh, the in-class assignment problems or anything like that, and, or an example, uh, we'll, we'll go over that again uh, to show you that that's exactly what's going on. We're just following the path in whatever sign or whatever polarity terminal we see first. If it's negative, we put a negative sign. If it's positive, we put a positive sign. That's the convention. It does not matter where you start from. It does not matter what direction you go. You just have to adopt that convention to be consistent. Uh, any other questions on uh, the general material or anything? Any questions regarding any problem or portion of a problem for the in-class assignment? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. The open circuit? Absolutely, yes. Okay, so uh, we got a request for problem three thus far. Does anybody have any questions regarding problems one or two? Yes, sir. Problem two? All right. So for problem two, um, there are a multitude of different loops that we could actually use uh, by applying KBL in this problem. The question then becomes, how do we look at this circuit and solve it in the most efficient manner possible? And so what I mean by that is, we're going to try to identify loops 
that only have a single unknown. Um, so for example, this loop that I'm outlining here in orange, if we followed it around either clockwise or counterclockwise, we would wind up with a term of both Vx and Vy in one equation. And that doesn't really do us any good because we'd still have to go through and find some other relationship in order to solve for things. So instead, I'm gonna do the one for Vx uh, kind of for you. So I'm trying to identify a loop where Vx is the only unknown quantity. So that means I'm going to try to avoid, oh, got sweat in my eye or something. This resistor, because I don't know any information about it whatsoever, and I'm going to try to avoid uh, this resistor for the same reason. I don't know what the voltage drop over it is or anything like that, so I'm trying to avoid it because if I have to include it, I'll have to write other equations in order to figure out what's going on there too. So to that end, I'm going to choose this as my first loop. Okay, uh, because the only unknown, quant only unknown voltage quantity in this loop is the voltage Vx. I know what the potential difference across the bottom portion of the loop is. Um, I know what the potential difference across the right-hand portion of the loop is. The top portion of the loop is a wire, which means that it inherently has a voltage drop of zero, uh, as was discussed in the video lecture. So the only unknown quantity is Vx. So then this begs the question, which direction should I follow my loop around? Clockwise, all right. Doesn't particularly matter, but we'll follow it clockwise. And where should I start? Also doesn't matter, so just give me a point. So top or bottom? Pardon? Okay, so right here. All right, so starting from the bottom left-hand corner of this loop, so KVL at blue loop. So starting at the bottom left-hand corner, what I see first is the negative polarity terminal associated with the voltage Vx, right? This negative sign right here is what I see first. So I'm gonna have negative Vx. Then as I follow my loop around the top path, I just have that wire. So I know the voltage drop is zero. I'm not gonna write it down. Then I see a positive polarity terminal associated with that 12 volt drop over the open circuit in the middle there. So I'll have plus 12 volts. Then I see the negative polarity terminal associated with my six volt source. So I'll have minus six volts. And I have to stop at the same point that I started from, which I've done now. So I set everything equal to zero and doing just a little bit of algebra. I can see that Vx is equal to 12 volts minus six volts is positive six volts. So I, I, like, like I spoke with, with a gentleman in the blue shirt a minute ago, whatever direction we go, whatever sign we see first is what we, we put in our equation. So when we saw the negative sign first on Vx and the negative sign first on the six volt source, we have negative signs. Where we saw the positive sign first on that 12 volt drop over the open circuit, that's why we have a positive 12 volt in our equation. If we had gone the opposite direction around our loop, we would have seen the positive sign first on the six volt and the VX, the negative sign first on the 12 volt. So we have the exact same equation, effectively just multiplied by a factor of minus one, which makes sense because we're going in the opposite direction. Uh, one thing that students tend to get a little tripped up on is that my loop here has a portion 
where we know for a fact flowing up or down through this open circuit. Because we're applying Kirchhoff's voltage law, where we're just adding up voltages, current is effectively inconsequential. If we know the voltage drops, the current doesn't matter remotely, okay? So think of it in a similar way to if you were applying a multimeter to a circuit, you want the voltage, you apply it at two points and you get the voltage drop between those two points. That's the exact same thing that's going on here. We know what the potential difference is between those two points, and that's all we need to know in order to, to apply Kirchhoff's voltage law. Um, all right, so to find Vy, does anybody have any suggestions on what loop we could use? Yes, ma'am. So the suggestion I believe Oops, what did I do? Is this loop, correct? All right, so that is a great loop. That's probably the most efficient one um, because it's the smallest possible while avoiding unknown information. Um, would you care to go clockwise or counterclockwise? Let's go counterclockwise just for the sake of argument. Alrighty, and where would you get to start? All right, so we're starting right here. So in this problem, we're starting in the middle of the loop as opposed to one of the corners. We're going in entirely the opposite direction as we did previously, but we should find that it really does not remotely matter. We're still gonna come up with the right answer. All right, so what do we see first as we follow the red loop up from that uh, starting point? The negative polarity terminal associated with the voltage Vy. So we'll have negative Vy. The top path is a wire, so the voltage drop is zero. Now we're heading down across that open circuit. So what do we see? positive 12 volts. Um, now we're heading down across the six volt source. What do we see? Positive polarity, all right. Uh, and we're going to the right across the wire, so that's plus zero. Uh, then we're going up. So we see the negative polarity terminal, the four volt source, so that's minus four volts. And now we have closed our loop in as much as we've arrived at the point we started from. Uh, so doing a little bit of algebra, we have Vy is equal to 12 plus 6 minus 4. So 18 minus 4 is positive 14 volts. We could have gotten that exact same relationship, but with a few extra terms included, if we did This loop I've outlined in orange. We could have got the exact same relationship if we did this other loop. Now that we know what Vx is, it really doesn't particularly matter which loop we choose as long as it's only got that one unknown uh, included. In. Um, all right, any other problems regarding? Right, and, and we could, if we were so inclined, for instance, I can go around this loop right here and see that the voltage drop over this resistor is going to be 12 volts using KVL. And I could go around this guy and see that it's going to be plus 2 volts, uh, positive flared on the left 2 volts using KVL as well, if I wanted to, for whatever reason, include those resistors. But it's other relationships that we have to throw in as well. Kirchhoff's voltage law is pretty powerful. We could use it to find everything. We just need to be smart about how we're applying it because we only have simple voltage relationships. So it's hard to really kind of set up a system like we will do a lot in uh, some of the other circuits. 
Any other questions regarding problem number two? All right. Uh, so I believe someone requested that we do problem three. So let's take a look at this guy. This is an example of a single node pair circuit. Um, so let me be very clear about that by identifying parts, right? We have this one at the top. In red and this one at the bottom in blue. So everything is connected in parallel. What does that mean about the voltage Vx, which in the uh, schematic drawing here is defined as the voltage drop across the six kilo ohm resistor, positive polarity on top. So if everything is in parallel, what does that mean about Vx? It's the voltage drop over everything, right? Because we know that everywhere along that red node point has the same potential because it's all connected by wires. Everywhere along the blue node point is at the same potential. So if there's a six volt difference between red and blue here at the left hand side of the circuit, there's a six volt potential everywhere between the red node and the blue node. So just for the sake of argument, I'm going to put in VX here and VX here to make it clear that that common voltage VX is the voltage drop over all of the resistors because we're gonna have to use that fact um, in a moment. All right, so for a single node pair circuit, uh, our best first step is usually to apply Kirchhoff's current law. So do we want to adopt the convention where currents leaving the top node are positive, currents entering the top node are positive, currents leaving the bottom node are positive, or currents entering the bottom node are positive? Which of those four options do you guys want to do? And we get the same result no matter which way we approach it. We just need to adopt a convention to be consistent about how we're going to write our equation. Uh, currents entering the top node are positive. All right, currents entering the top node are positive. All right, so KCL at top node entering is positive. All right, so we're going to start on the left hand side of the circuit and I'm redrawing my current IX here uh, because it may not be super obvious that it is entering the top node the way it was originally drawn, right? But in order for the current to be flowing left to right through that top left section of wire, it had to first flow up through the resistor. So Ix is entering, so that means we're going to have positive Ix. That's the current contribution from our 6 kilo ohm resistor. Now we have 6 milliamps entering, so is that going to be positive or negative? Entering is positive, right? All right, so plus 6 milliamps. Now we have four IX direction down. So it's exiting the top node. So we should have a negative sign. And now we have our two kilo ohm resistor. And we haven't yet defined uh, the direction for the current through that. So let's do it now. Do we want to assume that the current flowing through the two kilo ohm resistor is directed up or down? Up, okay. So, I'm going to call it I2K, that's the direction up. So we should see that our current I2K is positive. Now we have the current through the two milliamp source, it's direction down, so it should be negative. Sorry about that. 
And lastly, we have the current IY, which is the current that flows down through the three kilo ohm resistor as it makes that turn at the top right corner. Um, so it is exiting the top node. So it should have a negative sign. And we set it all equal to zero. So right now, we have one equation and three unknowns. Um, because this is a single node pair circuit, the most useful piece of information that we could find is actually the voltage Vx, because we know that that's the voltage drop over everything. So what we're going to do now is we're going to use Ohm's law to relate our three unknown currents, Ix, I2k, and Iy, to the voltage Vx using Ohm's law. So let's start with the relationship between Ix and Vx, right? So how are we going to express the current Ix in terms of Vx? Okay, so Vx divided by six kilohms. Um, does anybody agree with that? See a couple of heads nodding yes. Does anybody disagree? I disagree. Um, so the caveat here, and it's perfectly reasonable that you made this very simple and very common mistake, okay? Not, not a big deal whatsoever but the current is flowing into the negative polarity terminal, which means that we're gonna have to have an extra negative sign in order to make this resistor absorb power, right? Because as it's indicated here, current flowing into the negative polarity terminal means the resistor is supplying power and we know that it can't do that. So anytime we see the current flowing into the negative polarity terminal, we need to include a negative sign. Anytime the current is flowing into the positive polarity terminal, we include a positive sign. That's, that's the rule. Um, <clears throat> if we don't do that, we're gonna have issues with things uh, you know, not, not behaving as they're supposed to be. So with that in mind, how are we going to express the current I2K? in terms of the voltage Vx. So defining it up or down is telling us whether or not we're gonna have a positive sign or have a negative sign because of the polarity associated with Vx. So right now we have it drawn flowing up into the negative sign, right? Into the negative polarity terminal. So what, what does that mean for our equation? Right, so it'll be negative Vx divided by two kilo ohms. Now, just, uh, just to, to be clear here, we have a negative sign in our Ohm's law expression, and we have a positive sign in our KCL uh, expression. If we had chosen the opposite direction, we would have had a negative sign in our KCL expression and a positive sign in our Ohm's law expression. So it's gonna work itself out whatever, regardless of the direction that we choose, as long as we're consistent. So that's why I said earlier, it really doesn't matter which direction we choose, it's gonna work itself out when we apply Ohm's law if we, if we chose wrong and, and vice versa. Um, all right, lastly, we have the current IY. So what is that going to be in terms of uh, the voltage Vx? What was that? Vx over three kilo ohms. Positive because the current IY 
is flowing into the positive polarity terminal. So now we can substitute these three relationships into our original relationship. And what we're gonna have, uh, so Ix minus four Ix looks like negative three times Ix. So that's negative Bx over six kilo ohms. Then we have positive I2K, which is gonna be minus Bx over two kilo ohms and minus Iy, so that's minus Bx over three kilo ohms is equal to negative six milliamps plus two milliamps. And if we solve this guy, uh, I could simplify it further, but I'm lazy. That's what calculators are for. Um, hopefully all of our calculators have a numerical solver, a, a, the ability to solve a single equation with one unknown variable. Um, so I still have it in from when I did this in the last class. So if I solve it, what I am left with, or what my result is, is that Vx is equal to positive 12 volts, which agrees with what I told you the answer is. Um, now that we know Vx, we can easily determine the currents Ix and Iy using the Ohm's law, Ohm's law relationships that we developed to, be, to use substitution. So Ix is negative Vx, so that's negative 12 volts over two kilo ohms. Sorry, uh, six kilo ohms, got the wrong equation in my head. Turn off the eraser, there we go. So negative 12 over six looks like negative two. A volt per kilo ohm is a milliamp. And finally, Iy is Vx, so that's 12 volts over three kilo ohms. 12 over three is four volts per kilo ohms is still milliamps. And if we wanted to go through and check this, we could calculate the power absorbed by everything because we know every voltage and every current in the system and find that everything adds to zero, but that's uh, more work than I'm willing to do right now. Um, the answers match the answers I gave you, I'm satisfied. So any other questions regarding uh, the in-class assignment? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, if you're told the direction, so I mean, if, if, if there's a current with an associated arrow, then you work the problem assuming that direction, yes. Similarly, um, we were given the polarity of Vx. You know, if we had worked it where we had negative polarity on top, positive polarity on bottom, we would have found out that our answer was negative 12, right? So when you're given specific information regarding uh, directions and polarities and all that kind of stuff, then, you know, keep those in place. But for anything you're not given specific directions about, completely arbitrary what you choose. The signs will work themselves out. So, Ix, it will eventually exit the bottom node. Uh, so Ix is flowing around like this. Then it hits this node, and then presumably it's going to split. So some portion of it, which could be negative, will flow down this way. Some portion of it will flow this way, this way, this way, and this way. And then all those portions will wind up recombining here to flow back, right? We're not quite in a place yet where we're, where we can definitively say, if we know how much current is entering a node, how it's going to behave when it splits. We'll be there actually within a week, but right now that's a little bit beyond our, our level. We need to know a little bit more about how to apply KCL uh, and KVL 
um, and a couple of, I don't want to call them tricks per se, but uh, more advanced techniques using them in order to, to really figure out how things are going to split up and all that kind of stuff. We can't say, for instance, that IX flows around the perimeter because if there's an opportunity for it to split, we have to assume that it does so, right? Uh, they're not in series. None of these elements are in series. So there's no guarantee that the current that flows in um, continues along the outside path without branching off. Does that make sense at all? Any other questions regarding the uh, in-class assignment? Or anything? All right, so I had a question um, from the, the earlier section today. Uh, and they asked effectively, how do you know which technique to use? Uh, because like on your exams and stuff like that, I rarely ever tell you, use this particular circuit analysis technique. Um, there are a multitude of different ways that we could solve any circuit. You know, we saw with the Kirchhoff voltage law problem above, there are tons of different loops, tons of different starting places and, you know, two different directions that we could go for anything, even under the constraint that we're just supposed to apply Kirchhoff's voltage law. For this guy, we had four options on how to start, you know, whether currents that were leaving the top node were positive, currents entering the top node were positive, currents uh, leaving the bottom node were positive, currents entering the bottom node, bottom node were positive, lots of different possibilities, right? So um, since there's, always a multitude of different ways to work the problems. The students were asking, you know, how do you identify what's the best way? And I would start by looking at the circuit. Um, and so what I mean by that is if it's a single loop circuit where everything is in series, then your first step should usually be apply Kirchhoff's voltage law and try to figure out what the common current is that's flowing through all of the circuit. Uh, similarly, if you have a single node pair circuit like this problem, your first step is to apply Kirchhoff's current law and figure out how to get the common voltage that's over everything. Because once you know that common voltage, then you can use simple Ohm's law relationships to find all the currents through your resistors. And then you have enough information to determine the power through everything and all that kind of stuff. Um, if it's neither a single node pair circuit or a single loop circuit, then you're gonna to have to usually apply both KCL and KVL. Um, and so I worked an example problem uh, that tried to illustrate that. And I'd like to work uh, a different one for you guys, if that's okay. Let me find something. So I just kind of made something up. The analysis wasn't particularly difficult. Um, so I'll make something up for you guys as well. And then once we're finished with this, we're out of here. And our goal in this case will be to find power supplied by the two amp source, okay? So with that in mind, what information do we need to know in order to solve this problem? Positive and negative, what? So uh, we need to know the polarity of the voltage, okay? Um, so, so fundamentally, all right, our relationship for power is voltage times current. For a source, 
which we don't know what the, the resistance value is. That means that we need to know both the current through the source and the voltage drop over the source is, okay? Now you're absolutely correct that we need to know the polarity as well because the polarity is gonna determine whether or whether we're looking at a supplied power, which is what we're looking for, or the absorbed power. So because we want this applied power, we want the current that's flowing through our two amp source to be flowing into the negative polarity terminal, right? That's the passive sign convention rule. So if we want the current flowing into the negative polarity terminal, should the, polar, uh, so the positive polarity be on the left or right for our two amp source? The, the right, okay. So I'm gonna call this voltage VCS or V, uh, the voltage drop over the current source. Um, alrighty. Now, uh, because we're gonna wind up using a bit of this information, let's go ahead and assign voltages and currents for all of our resistors as well, okay? So for our five ohm resistor, do we want the positive polarity to be on top or bottom? Arbitrary choice, just pick one. Bottom, all right. So let's call that V5. Um, what about the two ohm resistor? Top or bottom? All right. Three ohm resistor, positive polarity, right or left? Right, all right. Very V3. Uh, now let's talk about our resistor currents. Uh, so with the five ohm resistor, do we want it, uh, the current to be up or down? Up, all righty. Let's call that I5. For the two ohm resistor, do we want it up or down? Down, okay. And for the three ohm resistor, do we want it directed to the right or to the left? Left, okay. All right, so what we're going to do really here is we're going to apply kind of a, a kitchen sink approach. And what I mean by that is that we have, let's see, one, two, three, four node points. So there's four different places that we could write a Kirchhoff's current law equation. There are one, two, three loops that we could write KVL equations for. So that's seven equations right there. We're not gonna need all seven uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, and then we also have Ohm's law relationships that we're going to wind up using uh, because we know that Ohm's law is going to relate the voltage drop over a particular resistor to the current flowing through that resistor, which is gonna be helpful. So we're gonna develop uh, probably three or four relationships and then use Ohm's law to get some more things to create interrelations and then wind up with a system of equations most likely um, that we're gonna have to solve in order to, to get our answer here. So I'm gonna identify my nodes real quick because it'll make it a little bit easier. And let's start by writing a KCL equation. So which node do you guys want to write the KCL equation for? Tell me one of the four colors I drew. Uh, so do you wanna write it for the green node or the purple node that's connected to the green node? Okay. Um, so, KCL at our green node. Um, let's see, we have two amps flowing in, right? Um, so I'm gonna say that flowing in is positive. 
we have I3 is flowing in and we have I2 is flowing out. So sum of the currents flowing in is equal to the sum of the currents flowing out. Alrighty, nothing wild or crazy there. So we have one equation with two unknowns. So let's pick uh, another node to write a KCL equation in. The purple one, all right. And we'll choose the same convention. Uh, so currents flowing in are positive, uh, which means that I2 is positive. Currents flowing out are negative. So we can see that I5 is flowing out. And we can also see that I3 is flowing out, right? Because for it to be flowing up and around to the left through the eight volt source, it has to be flowing out of the purple node. Everybody okay with that? All right, so plus I3. So now we have two equations and three unknowns. Uh, so let's uh, let's pick a Kirchhoff's voltage law equation. So our options are three different loops. So we have the left-hand loop, the right-hand loop, and the outside loop. Which uh, which one do you guys want to do? The outside loop. All right. All right, so where do you want to start from? So down here in this corner. All right, so we are going to have, we see the positive polarity terminal of V5 first, then we see the negative polarity terminal of VCS, then we see the positive polarity terminal of V3, then we see the positive polarity terminal of our eight volt source, and that's it is equal to zero. So now we have three equations and several more unknowns. Um, so let's see. Let's start writing some Ohm's law equations and then see what we can get out of that. All right, so let's start by relating V5 and I5. What's that relationship going to be? Sorry, what was that? Okay. All righty, so that, that all right, that, uh, yeah, current's flowing into the positive polarity terminal, so everything's got positive signs, that's good. All right, what about our two ohm resistor? How are we gonna relate V2 and I2? So it'll be V2 over two ohms. And lastly, our three ohm resistor. So it'll be negative V3 over three ohms. All right, so Alrighty, so if we substitute in the Ohm's law, Ohm's law relationships into our Kirchhoff's current law equations, um, what we would have, let's see, so we're going to have I2, so let's write this underneath here, V2 over 2 ohms minus negative V3. Uh, I, I'm moving I3 to the other side of the equal sign. So it's going to be minus negative V3 over 3 ohms. So it's going to look like plus V3 over 3 ohms is equal to negative 2 amps. So that's put that current relationship in terms of some of the unknown voltages. Now let's look at this KCL at our purple node equation. So 
we're going to have I5, which is V5 over 5 ohms plus I3, which is negative V3 over 3 ohms minus I2, so that's minus V2 over 2 ohms is equal to zero. So right now we have one equation in terms of V2 and V3, two equations in terms V2, V3, and V5, and then we have a third equation here which has a V3 and a V5, but it also has a VCS. So we're going to need one last equation to solve this guy uh, that involves VCS. We need something else that it relates to in order to, to make our system work out here. Uh, so what are we going to do with that? So what loop is left that includes VCS that we haven't done thus far? The left hand loop, all right. Now, it actually looks like I might have made this problem technically too difficult to solve with our calculators, but that'll be okay. Um, so KVL with our left hand loop. Um, let's start from that bottom left hand corner again. So we have positive V5 minus VCS plus V2 is equal to zero. And there's our fourth equation. So we now have four equations in terms of our four unknown voltages. So I'm going to go ahead and write out uh, the matrix relationship, but we're not going to bother solving it. A, because uh, we technically have ran out of time, and B, because most of our calculators can't do it. If you have a Casio 991, it's the only NCEES calculator that you can use in this class that can solve the system of four equations, four unknowns. Um, for everybody else, it's, uh, it's a problem for MathCAD. Um, which if you don't have experience using MathCAD, when we get to nodal analysis and mesh analysis in roughly three lectures, um, I'll spend some time showing you guys how to use it. And if you don't yet have it, there are signs all around this building with big QR codes that say, you know, if you need MathCAD, go to this link. If you need SOLIDWORKS, go to this link, etc. So literally come out the room, go to the left, and on your way to the exit, there'll be a sign telling you how to get MathCAD. Alrighty, so our matrix relationship, where if we were foolish enough, we could use Kramer's rule to solve it, but I don't want to take the determinant of a four by four matrix. Um, so we're going to have V2, V3, V5, and VCS as our variables. Here's our All right, so our coefficient for V2 in our first equation is one half. Our coefficient for V3 is one third. Our coefficient for V5 is zero. Our coefficient for VCS is zero. And our answer is negative two. For our second equation, we have negative one half as our coefficient for V2, negative one third as our coefficient for V3, positive one-fifth as our coefficient for V5, zero, and our answer is zero. And yes. Uh, because I made a dumb mistake. So um, what I did was I moved I3 to the, the right-hand side, and then I just Put a dumb negative sign there that shouldn't be there because it should be two amps is equal to I2 minus I3 
uh, positive two amps is equal to I two minus I three. So thank you for pointing that out because that would have. Oh uh, yeah, no. If you see me make like some um, asinine mistake, by all means interrupt and, and let me know because I'd rather, I'd rather you you interrupt me so that I get it right than you guys learn to do it wrong. I have no no problem with with being wrong. I know for a fact I make dumb mistakes all the time. Um, okay. So equation three, we have zero as our coefficient for V2, one for our coefficient for V3, one for our coefficient for V5, negative one for our coefficient for VCS. And when I move eight volts over to the other side, it's going to look like negative eight. And then lastly, we have positive one for V2, zero for V3 positive one for V5, negative one for VCS is equal to zero. And now with this matrix, you can solve this system of equations easily using uh, computer, online tools, all that kind of jazz, or chamber tools, again, if you wanted to do it by hand. I don't want to. Uh, I apologize for throwing a problem that's too hard for you guys to solve without the use of the computer. On the second day of class, I didn't really uh, think that through, but you know, it is what it is. Uh, you've got more experience with harder problems now than the uh, the section earlier, so congratulations. Um, that does bring up one last little thing. So on the exams and stuff like that, the expectation is that you will be able to use your calculators to solve at a maximum a three by three uh, set of equations. Anything beyond that would require the use of circuit simplification tools, which we don't know yet. So like there is absolutely a way to make this problem reduce down to a three by three system. We're just not quite there. Um, I typically speaking though, don't require you to have to use those uh, fairly often. So it should be pretty obvious, you know, if it's a three by three system uh, using this particular circuit analysis technique and a five by five system using a different technique, don't use the five by five way to, to do and so that, that will help guide you as to what analysis method that you should be doing. All right, that's enough out of me. Uh, see you guys on Friday.